Welcome to today's webinar, Overview and Update of Disease Modifying Therapies in Multiple Sclerosis. And our presenter today is Jane Bridgman, and I'm your facilitator, Nicola Graham. So we'd like to start our programmes with an acknowledgement. We acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians, past and present, on whose lands we meet today. And we acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country, and we respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. So just a note about informed choice and how symptoms of MS vary from person to person. So the information we provide today are general in nature. And I'd like to introduce our presenter, Jane Bridgman. So Jane is a registered nurse. She's got six years experience in disability, aged care, progressive neurological conditions and primary health care. She is an internationally certified MS nurse and works as an MS nurse advisor here at uh, MS in Melbourne. And a note there about the MS Nurse Advisor and about MS Connect and a little bit more information about that later. So I'm just going to pass over to Jane now and she can say hello to you and then we'll turn that webcam off. And hello, proceed with our presentation. Lovely, thank you Nicola. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning. So we'll be covering uh, what we call disease modifying therapies. and we also can call those immunotherapies, and the way that they work is by modifying the immune system. The way that these medications work is to slow the frequency and the severity of relapses, um, and they do this by probably getting in the way of our immune system attacking the central nervous system, which means that the myelin sheath are subjected to less damage, um, which means we don't develop as many lesions, and this results in less disability progression. So um, I hope that you can see on this uh, graph here, which is from the Brain Health Time Matters Initiative, that for those people with uh, relapsing remitting MS, if they start on treatment um, upon diagnosis, then they're likely um, to have a, a better outcome than those who may start on disease modifying therapy a little bit later and um, those who perhaps uh, don't go on disease modifying therapy at all um, are perceived to potentially have a, a worse outcome. So with disease modifying therapies, they are currently only available on the PBS or the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme for relapsing remitting MS only. The Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme is the way that the government provides funding um, for these medications. So the current medications we have include oral medications, which are tablets or capsules. We also have some self-injected medications, which can include uh, subcutaneous injections or intramuscular injections. And we also have some what's called intravenous agents, which is a powder that's mixed in with the fluid, which is then infused into the body via a vein. So with the oral medication, we have Jelenia, which is a daily tablet, uh, usually taken in the morning. We have Orbagio, which is also a daily tablet, usually taken in the morning. There's also Tecfidera, and Tecfidera is taken twice a day, so once in the morning, once at night. And then uh, we have Mavenclad, which is a, a little bit of a newer medication. And that has what's called a, a complex dosing regime. So in week one, the tablet is taken daily for five days. And then in week five, um, again for five days. And that regime is then repeated in year two. And it's worth noting with Mavenclad that the dosing is dependent on body weight. So for some people, they will be prescribed to take more tablets than others, um, just depending on the body weight. With the injectable treatments, um, we categorise them by subcutaneous or intramuscular. And that really tells us about where the drug is administered, um, which is quite important because the drugs are developed um, 
to be administered in a specific area such as um, in the subcutaneous fat or for example in the muscle and if we actually inject a drug into the wrong spot it, it potentially won't be absorbed as well which means it doesn't work as well so it is important to understand the difference with injectable therapies. With the subcutaneous therapies uh, we have capaxone Capaxone uh, used to be available in another dose, but um, it is now only available in three times a week, which is commonly uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. There's also betaferon, which is every second day, uh, Rebif, which is uh, every third day, and uh, Plegridi, which is once a fortnight. So they're all subcutaneous injections. We also have Avonex, which is a weekly intramuscular injection. So that one goes a little bit deeper. In terms of the infusions, uh, we have Tysabri, which is a monthly infusion. Um, we also have Ocrevus, uh, and that's one of our newer treatments as well. Ocrevus is usually administered every six months, but we break the first infusion in half just to minimise the effect of the side effects um, and give the body a little bit of a chance to get used to the medication. So you have um, half a dose on day one, and then on day 15, you have the second half of that dose. Following that, it is every six months that the drug is infused. And all of these infusions are um, kind of day infusions. So it's not something that usually requires um, overnight stays in hospitals. It's usually done in um, the infusion centre or an outpatient department. We also have Lemtrada. And Lemtrada also has a... Um, a complex dosing regime. So in the first year of treatment, it is daily for five days. And then in year two, it's daily for three days. And that also has a longer lasting effect. So that's why it has a, a shorter dosing uh, regime. It's quite important to talk about the side effects of medication because all medications have side effects. Um, and we need to understand perhaps how common those side effects may be, um, how bad they might be if they occur, and also what we can do to manage them. Because we want to understand are the benefits going to weigh the negatives um, and what to expect as well. So knowing what to expect and what to do about those side effects can really change um, someone's experience on a medication because it means that you can be prepared so it's always good to know what are the commonly reported side effects so that uh, if you start taking a medication and something happens, you can know that perhaps it's actually an expected side effect versus something that you should be a bit more concerned about. And another question is, what should you do if you experience them? Because sometimes if we know a side effect is common, we might even be able to set somebody up with a bit of a plan of how to manage those side effects if they happen or even some medication to manage those side effects. So don't be afraid to ask questions or seek clarification and get further information about side effects. Um, and some sources of information about these um, can be from an MS nurse if you have one. I know that not everybody is able to go to an MS clinic or have access to a face-to-face -face MS nurse, but um, you all do have access to me um, and my nurse advisor colleague here. So you can always contact us uh, for information or support. A neurologist is a very good source of information about these kinds of things and the best person to speak to if you can. A GP, a pharmacist, and also a patient support program. And if you're not very familiar with the patient support program, um, I will be going into that a little bit later. And also seeking regular reviews. That's really important because quite often you might start on a treatment and be doing quite well on that drug and then maybe stop going to the neurologist or stop checking in to see, is the drug still the best choice for me? Sometimes side effects may develop a little bit um, over time and so for example an injectable therapy perhaps at the start when someone commences on an injectable drug um, that's not too bothersome but maybe after a couple of years um, those injection sites might not be as viable anymore so seeking a review and also a review of the side effects 
we may expect that somebody starting a medication might have some um, tummy upset, for example, but we wouldn't necessarily expect that to still be there six months later. So it is good to check in and review those side effects and also find out what else can I do to minimise those side effects. There's often lots of little tips and tricks that we're aware of or we've learned over the years. And it may be as simple as having a medication with food or it may be um, that a injectable therapy needs to be taken out of the fridge and warmed up before it's used. So there's lots of little things that can help. Um, so again, don't hesitate to uh, be in touch because we certainly don't want the side effects um, to overshadow the benefit of the medication. Changing medication is also an interesting topic um, because we need to consider um, do we need to change the medication or is it still the right one? So the experience of side effects is quite important. Um, quite often we can manage the side effects of disease modifying therapy, but every now and then the side effects may be so severe that the neurologist will actually decide to change someone's treatment because of that. Lifestyle changes are a really big one. Uh, a lot of people that are diagnosed with MS are young women and um, they're also a common population to have babies. And so pregnancy planning um, is quite important. And sometimes that is a good reason to change medication. It also may be that um, you might be planning a really big trip. And if you're on a monthly infusion, for example, that might not be suitable if you're planning to move overseas or travel around the world, for example. Control of relapses is really important because that's what we're using the medication for, to prevent future lesions, to prevent future relapses where we can and minimise how the disease um, progresses. So if we feel like there's breakthrough disease activity or that the drug perhaps isn't effective enough anymore, then that tells us that perhaps we should have a review and see if something else um, has, has come about. Other changes in health is also quite important. Uh, just because you have MS, it doesn't mean that you can't have other health conditions going on. So sometimes something else might happen. Um, it could be um, breast cancer, for example, or another health condition, which means that um, the medication you're on probably isn't the safest option. So that can be a reason that we might change. Um, or it could be something to do with your MS. So maybe someone's on an injectable therapy, but due to the increasing numbness or clumsiness in the hands, it might be too difficult to dose that medication. Getting assistance in maintaining treatment is also um, really important because once you start these therapies, you're on them for quite some time. So learning the dosing regime, as in how often it should be dosed, what time of day, the best way to do it, um, and the technique is also quite important. Um, with the infusion medications, obviously there is someone else that stores the medication and prepares it for you, but there are ways to prepare for those infusions, which is quite important. Um, being well hydrated the day before you have an infusion and the day off can make it much easier for the infusion nurses to uh, find a vein. Um, and obviously with the injectable drugs, um, that is very uh, dependent on technique. But even with oral medications, uh, a big concern is how people may store their medication. So it may be that you go to the chemist and pick up your prescription and, and put those um, medications in your pocket or your handbag or with the groceries. Um, and often we might leave that in the car in the sun or take that somewhere else that might heat up. And these medications really should be stored um, away from warm sunlight and not on the dashboard of the car or in a car that can become warm. So it is good just to keep an eye on that, even with um, oral medications. Pre and post care is a big one as well. So I think I just touched on what we can do beforehand um, and also what we can do afterwards that makes a big difference. Um, and again, managing those side effects. So continually checking in with your treating team or a patient support program to touch base on how those side effects are going. Some medications have ongoing testing requirements um, and that's really about uh, checking how the side effects are and how the drug is working. 
for some medications it may be a uh, monthly blood test or, or a urine test for example. Um, other tests it might just be looking at the white blood cell count to see if that's dropped and come back up to where we need it to be. And then for um, other medications it might be just checking that some of the side effects haven't occurred. And again some of the available support um, is contacting MS Connect, um, the MS Clinic and MS Nurses um, if you've got access to those otherwise calling in to us, the patient support programs and the neurologist. So with the patient support programs these are all funded individually by the drug companies that make the medication and the patient support programs do provide different levels of support. So um, you can see there that uh, Jelenia is manufactured by Novartis and they have a program that uh, assists with just the startup and the startup um, is a term we use to describe when someone starts medication, what we need to get them organised and, and get them going. And then other programs such as MS Alliance by Biogen um, provides kind of an ongoing support so you can contact them as you need for any support regarding those medications. Um, quite often these programs um, are also providing what we call the consumables. So that's more specific to injectable um, therapies, but if you're using a, an auto injector, uh, which is like a little device that helps you administer the injection or Sharps containers, for example, these companies will provide those and provide the training. And then for other programs like blood watch or Lentrada, that is really around monitoring those blood test results and letting you know how those go. So if you're on a medication that's listed here and you didn't know about the support program and you'd like to know more about it, um, don't hesitate to contact us um, and we can tell you about what they offer and um, give you their contact details or if you're happy to we can make a referral on your behalf. Um, you certainly don't have to be a part of a support program but sometimes it just offers that little bit of extra information and somewhere to go to if you are experiencing side effects or want some assistance on that medication. So in summary, um, it's good just to note that what I'm talking about today is the kind of disease modifying therapy, um, which I've got on the left of this table here. Um, but there's so much more involved in treating MS. So there's also relapse management for some people, um, if they are having a type of MS that involves relapses. And that can include steroids where needed, um, rehabilitation, symptom management, um, complementary and alternative medicines, which we can use across the board, and also AIDS equipment and adaptations. Lifestyle choices is also um, an important factor when we're thinking about treating MS and living well with MS. Um, so diet, exercise, smoking and stress all play a role in general health in MS. And then there's also symptom management, and that's where we address each symptom that bothers you day to day. And that can involve medication, uh, rehabilitation, complementary and alternative medicines, AIDS equipment and adaptation, and again, lifestyle choices and strategies. So these medications that I've been talking about today um, are not going to um, change the symptoms that people experience day to day in terms of taking away those symptoms. These medications um, don't fix any damage that's already occurred they really work in a preventative way. So once we have that preventative drug in place that's kind of working behind the scenes, then we look at all of these other things that we can do as well, which gives us the best outcome. And a little bit of what's new, because there is always uh, new information that's um, popping up um, sometimes on the news and sometimes it's quite quiet. Um, and we really have to keep an eye out. So we now have Jelenia on the PBS for children and adolescents, um, because sadly MS is a condition that's diagnosed in, in children um, as, long, as young as 11 years old. There's also a generic version of Orbagio as well. So um, if you're on that medication, you may have been offered to go on a generic medication um, and it is your choice whether you choose to go on the generic 
or the uh, brand name medication. Um, and it's probably a good thing to have a think about. Um, there's not much of a price difference, if um, none at all. I think perhaps some pharmacies might offer a $1 price difference, but otherwise the difference in price is not a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a good conversation to have with your um, doctor or even perhaps with us to learn a bit more about what that means if you do switch to the generic. There's also a medication called um, Mazent. Its brand name um, is Mazent and the generic name is Saponamod, which is actually quite similar to Fingolimod, which is Gelenia. And Saponamod um, has been proven effective in clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting and secondary progressive MS. But here in Australia, the TGA, which is the Therapeutic Goods Administration, they have approved saponamide for secondary progressive MS. And that's really exciting because we've not yet had a treatment available in Australia for secondary progressive MS. It is not yet approved by the PBS, which means it's not um, available the same way the other drugs are, um, but we are hoping that that does happen. And there's a, three drugs that are actually going forward for listing on the PBS. So there's Mazent, which we've discussed, Sativex, which is a type of medicinal cannabis um, that is used in symptom management um, for spasticity that, that usually hasn't responded to other treatments. And there's also a drug called Zaposia, which its generic name is Ozanamod, and Ozanamod is uh, for relapsing remitting. And those three drugs are being put forward to the PBAC, and the PBAC is the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. And that's an independent panel of um, experts uh, and some members of the community. And they are the ones who look at submissions and decide whether a drug should be on the PBS or not. So they are meeting um, in March 2020, this month, um, to look at those submissions. So we'll have to stay tuned on um, how that goes. And just a note about what's happening overseas. Um, in the USA, saponamod and uh, Mavenclad have been approved by the FDA, uh, which is the Federal Drug Administration, um, for secondary progressive MS. Um, and in the UK, they do actually have Ocrevus listed for primary progressive um, on the national health system. So Ocrevus is proven beneficial in primary progressive MS and relapsing remitting, but in Australia, um, it has not been given PBS listing for primary progressive MS. So we are um, obviously hoping that we can have therapies available for everybody, but at this stage, that's um, not the case for primary progressive. And I do just have a little cartoon there, um, which I thought was quite relevant. Um, it's a doctor talking to a patient and the doctor says, it's quite serious. Take this medication when it's available, whenever you can afford it. And I think that's relevant because I think we all understand how much we need effective medications that are available at a reasonable price. Um, and we are certainly encouraging of, of new therapies to become available. And just to look at our future directions, what we think might be coming up and, and what we're learning. Um, it would be wonderful to have drugs on the PBS for primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS. Um, and there's also recently been a number of news articles on the uh, DIPPA trial. And DIPPA is our medication um, that has previously been used in another condition, but it has been trialled um, to look for the benefits in myelin repair and regeneration. And that is quite um, exciting because we've never had a medication that can actually repair the damage that's already happened. This drug is able to cross the blood brain barrier um, and in the animal studies, um, it's been shown to repair previous damage and um, those mice have been able to actually walk again. Their symptoms have been reversed. Um, it's still in the pre clinical phase so uh, it's not quite not quite yet but ready for the public but we are excited to see how that will um, develop uh, there might be a vaccine for the Epstein-Barr virus which we think might play a role in people developing MS and we're certainly learning a lot more about gut health and the link between brain health and gut health we have a wonderful webinar 
on our website already by someone called Dr. Wolfgang Marx um, that talks specifically about gut health and MS. And I really encourage you to, to watch it. It's very interesting. and I, I learned a lot watching it. And I just have some resources here um, for your reference. Uh, the top one is our website. There's also MS Research Australia. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they do have a newsletter, so you can keep up to date about what's new. And there's also an MS Clinical Trials Network. So in terms of the clinical trials in Australia that are relevant to the MS space, they are all listed on this website. Um, and there's a very easy way to review them. So you can check them by state, um, whether the type of MS is relevant and whether they're recruiting. Uh, sometimes it might be about disease modifying therapies, but other times it might be looking at do exercise regimes make a difference or what about mental health or um, do nano gold particles have a benefit for people who had optic neuritis. So there's lots of trials there and the only way we have drugs available and learn new information is through clinical trials. So perhaps if you feel comfortable, have a look and see if there's anything that um, sparks your interest. There's also the MS Trust, which is a UK based organisation, um, which has a wealth of information on their website. One of my favourite articles there is uh, what's causing my symptom. It's a little tool where you can click what symptoms you have and it can tell you a bit more about them. There's also a, um, a project through Sydney University called the Lambert Initiative and that's looking at medicinal cannabis, which is quite interesting. There's also a general health symptom checker on Health Direct, which is a government website. Um, and that can be quite beneficial, not even just in MS, but in general health. So if you're at home and you notice that you've got a few symptoms, you can pop in your age and your gender and what your symptoms are, and it will ask you a series of screening, screening questions and tell you whether you need to monitor that at home or call a nurse or go to the emergency department. And there's also the National Continence Helpline. So if you are experiencing any continence changes, you can call that number for free and access um, expert and confidential support through a continence nurse specialist. Um, so I'll hand over to Nicola, but I'll just let you know again that um, you can access the uh, MS Nurse Advisor Service by calling MS Connect. Um, and they're open 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. Um, you can call them. Um, if they don't answer, please do leave a voicemail. We take them very seriously and respond to them as soon as possible. Um, you can also email us. Um, and there's also a live chat option on our website as well. So hopefully there's a, a way that you can contact us that suits you. Um, and then we can organise to have a chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. That was really clear. I have got a few questions, including, as we anticipated, some questions about coronavirus. Yes. So um, I'm aware um, the webinar is for 30 minutes, but I would like to spend um, a couple of minutes now running through some questions and then finally we'll, we'll run through very briefly some of our services. Um, I feel that we covered this, but I just want to make sure that Keith's happy. Um, and so Keith has asked, are there any new medications for primary progressive? He says he's had no change in his medication since being diagnosed in 2009. Mm -hmm. And further, he indicates which medication he's on, and I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly, aminopyridine. Sure. So aminopyridine um, is not a disease modifying therapy, it's a symptom management. And no, Keith, um, we don't have any new disease modifying therapies for primary progressive MS. The only one that has been developed um, and proven to be beneficial is Oprivus. Um, but as I discussed, it's not on the PBS at this stage. So sadly, it's um, not available and accessible for um, most of the people living with primary progressive MS. As an aside, Jane, can people purchase that? I imagine they're next. Ah, yes, you can. Um, a, a single dose of Oprivus uh, involves two vials of medication and two vials of medication um, will roughly set you back about fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars and I believe the drug company does have a program um, to help out a little bit where I think um, for every two vials of the drug that you buy they will give you the third one for free so that saves you about seven or eight thousand dollars which is something but I still appreciate that is prohibitively expensive for most people every six months. 
David has asked a question that I know many of the people listening today will be interested in. And can we cover off the current issue with coronavirus and DMTs going in for a crevasse in one week and keen to know how seriously this might impact? Sure. So that's a really good question and, and a relevant concern to have given what's happening. But it is not something I could probably probably address in such a short period of time. Um, so I would very much encourage you to contact your treating team, the doctors that have prescribed that for you and or the hospital that you're having that infusion at. Um, you're very welcome to contact us at MS and I can have a one-on-one -on -one chat with you about that. Um, there's also a coronavirus hotline as well, but um, there's probably a bit more information that I'd like to give um, that would probably overshadow this topic today. So um, perhaps we can chat about that offline. Mm -hmm. So David, if you could call in on one eight hundred zero four three one three eight, we're happy to to chat with you more one on one. And I do understand there's an SMS coming out from. Could you talk to that, Jane? Oh yes, I, I believe we have some correspondence coming out, and there'll be there's an article on our website, and there's also an article on the website of MS Australia um, regarding the COVID-19 coronavirus um, with some recommendations. Um, and of course, following very strict hand hygiene um, is very important, as is staying generally well at the moment where we can. Um, another question here from Anne, which is possibly rather specific, but I'll ask it anyway, Jane, and you can um, determine. So Anne says she's got overseas travel in April, which is cancelled. Sorry to hear about that, Anne. Uh, ceased injecting plegridine due last week on advice from the neurologist. <laughs> Can I resume my injection this evening, although this will be one week late? Uh, that is probably a bit of a specific question, um, Anne, so probably something we might need to um, chat through a little bit further, or a good question to ask uh, MS Alliance, the patient support program, uh, for that. Great. Thanks, Jane. And then finally, if you Question. So Doug is asking, will long-term use of Rebif, 10 years, reduce my general immunity? That's a good question. I don't know that um, I have the uh, information available to um, advise whether that actually would be the case. It might be something I'd have to look into a little bit further. So Doug, we'll email you back with that. I have your email address, so we'll, we'll email, email you on that. Um, Shiva Kumar is asking, when will DICTA human clinical trials start? We think that um, at the moment, it's still a few years away. Um, I think they're in the stage at the moment of seeking funding for human clinical trials. Uh, it would be just a, a guess at this stage and not a very educated one, but it could perhaps be a number of years before that happens. Maria's got a comment here about her treatment and um, saying she's on a creep ocrevus and um, had her treatment last week. So some people are still receiving that treatment, but as you mentioned, Jane, it's a very personal um, situation, isn't it? That's a topic to discuss that. So it's not it's definitely not a one size and one recommendation fits all. No. Okay, that's all our questions that we have at the moment. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for typing your questions in. I'm just going to mention very quickly some of our services. Um, as Jay mentioned, we have MS Connect. There's many good reasons to call us, and some of them are listed here. We also have peer support, recognising how important it is to talk to and connect to people in a similar situation. And the access to our peer support is via MS Connect. We have an online tool called Get Your Act Together, where you can get further information about some of the common symptoms of MS. We have a wonderful MS employment support service, which helps people who are in employment to stay in employment and also can help people find new employment. And again, the access to that service is through MS Connect. We are a registered NDIS provider and we provide different services in different areas. And here's a list of currently what we're providing and where. We just draw your attention as well to My Age Care for people who are over 65. And this is a government service that can help to map out your needs and assess any further supports. And the details for how to access My Age Care are here on this slide. 
So once again, thank you very much for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars.